We will go to uh, Bruce now. Bruce Lampier, uh, I introduced him earlier, is a colleague of mine from uh, uh, the work we've done collaboratively on the National Children's Study, but he's uh, been the driving force of a large uh, uh, research uh, group at Cincinnati Children's Hospital that is focused on attention deficit disorder and environmental influences uh, associated with uh, a lead exposure and smoking exposure during pregnancy. So it's my honor to introduce Bruce and let him tell you about environmental factors associated with attention deficit disorder. Well, thank you very much for the uh, invitation and honor to join you for this conference. It's been, the last few days has been just delightful to get to know more about the culture and colleagues here in Riyadh and Saudi Arabia. What I wanted to do is to focus on some of the research that has shown that environmental toxicants in particular serve as risk factors for the development of ADHD. And the reason I think this is particularly important is not because it will help us think about treating children who already have the condition, but rather because we might be able to pre prevent some children from developing ADHD by focusing on some of the toxicants I'll talk about today. And this shouldn't necessarily surprise us. The kinds of toxicants I'll talk about have been shown both in animal studies and in human studies to impact the nervous system, the brain tissue in particular. And so this shouldn't be a particular surprise. And I'll try to walk through why uh, we think that lead in particular is an important problem that we can begin to address in the near future and has particular relevance to Saudi Arabia, uh, in particular with the uh, exposures to leaded gasoline, even though that has been banned. But of course, children who were born uh, at a time when they were exposed are experiencing ADHD. So just a very general back, uh, context or background to uh, the the focus on environmental toxicants. First, most of the toxicants that we recognize, mercury, PCBs, lead, and so forth, were only discovered as a result of environmental disasters. We really don't have any systematic approach to identify these before they're uh, distributed in the environment through consumer products or what have you. Second, there's increasing evidence linking toxicants with cognitive deficits like intellectual abilities and behavior problems at levels previously thought to be innocuous or safe despite the fact that we've seen dramatic reductions in blood lead levels in children and adults, we're finding even at the lowest levels measurable evidence of toxicity. And we're also beginning to find that uh, low level exposures to toxicants like lead, like tobacco, are associated with child and adolescent psychopathology. And in particular, I'll talk about ADHD. In the United States, we're finding that many of the environmental toxicants are to a greater or lesser extent associated with what we call the new morbidities of childhood. As the old morbidities, polio, cholera, and typhoid have diminished, we've seen a new form of morbidity arise, asthma, learning problems, behavior problems, many of these of quite high prevalence. Asthma, about 11%, preterm birth, 8 to 12 percent, depending upon which country you're in. You've heard much about ADHD epidemiology for, from Dr. John this morning. Um, in the United States, our best estimates using DSM-4 criteria are about 8.7 percent. And I'll focus mostly on behaviors and ADHD. The first two slides really emphasize the role of tobacco, which may not be especially relevant here because the evidence so far would suggest that a child is at risk if they are exposed during pregnancy to a mother who smokes. And smoking among women during pregnancy is quite unusual here, but this is an important concept. And then I'll talk more about lead, which does have more specific relevance to Saudi Arabia. In this slide, in New Zealand, Ferguson found that children who were prenatally exposed to tobacco, that is the mother smoked, had a shift in their behavior scores 
indicating that children who were prenatally exposed to smoke were more likely to have behaviors consistent with conduct problems, attention deficit type problems, and disruptive behaviors. Now this was in early childhood. Studies now that have done uh, case control approaches, case control study designs, have found that essentially what happens is these subtle differences that we observe in young children can become manifest as more severe problems or disorders in older children and adolescents. So in this case, a number of studies that have been done looking at whether children who are prenatally exposed to tobacco smoke, again, that is the mother smoked, were more likely to experience uh, ADHD. These studies found anywhere from about a two to, to four-fold higher adjusted odds ratio based upon prenatal exposure to tobacco. Now these were adjusted for a number of factors, uh, but only one of them looked to see whether there was an effect after adjusting for parental psychopathology. And that's one of the major limitations we have of these types of studies. Most of them have not adjusted for parental psychopathology, and it's something to, to, to recognize. Let's talk more about lead. This is uh, the seminal study in childhood lead exposure, and it was quite innovative. Herb Needleman went out and he asked children, school-aged children, six to seven-year-old school-aged children, to donate their baby teeth, their primary teeth. And he had his laboratory analyze those teeth for different concentrations of lead. Now, most of you know that we store most of our lead in our bones and the tooth is a bony type tissue and so it provided a cumulative biomarker or a cumulative measure of exposure throughout the child's first six years and perhaps even a bit of prenatal exposure. And then he had the homeroom teachers rate these children on a whole host of behaviors from distractibility, dependability in, in the classroom, whether they were organized or easily frustrated. And what he found was this striking dose-response relationship. Higher tooth lead levels were associated with many of the features that we now think about as associated with ADHD. A similar study was done again by Ferguson in New Zealand in the, in the Dunedin longitudinal cohort, and he used measures of inattention and restlessness restlessness, excuse me, uh, based on the Rudder and Connor scale and found again a nice dose-response relationship. Some people take these studies and infer that lead causes ADHD, but up until quite recently there really hadn't been any studies that looked at lead exposure with a specific diagnosis, DSM-4 criteria for example, uh, and, and um, what we've done in the past few years along with some others, Joel Nigg in particular, is to try to do just that. This is a study that's in press and pediatrics. And what we did is we took advantage of the fact that there's this national survey in the United States, in Haines, and we were able to look at several thousands of children. And there was a validated instrument, the DISC, which has been shown based upon validation using a psychiatric diagnosis to help us understand based on a maternal or a parental survey, whether a child meets criteria for ADHD, again using DSM-IV criteria. And after taking a variety of factors into account, the age of the child, the sex of the child, race and ethnicity, preschool attendance, maternal age at birth, birth weight, iron status, and several other factors, we found that there was this dose-response relationship. That is, children in the highest tercile or tertile of exposure we're about 2.5 times more likely to uh, meet criteria for ADHD. Similarly, we could do the same for those children who were prenatally exposed to tobacco. And after taking, in the same basic analysis, after taking these other factors into account, once again, children who are prenatally exposed to tobacco were about two and a half times more likely to, to, be, to meet criteria. What I think was a bit of a surprise, because both of these risk factors, both of, the, both of these environmental toxicant exposures have been shown previously to be risk factors for ADHD, but what we found is when we looked at the combined effect, so in this case, if we'll focus for a minute, on this part of the slide, these three uh, bar graphs, for children who did not have prenatal tobacco exposure, we see a dose-response relationship such that children in the top two Tersiles 
we're significantly more likely, about two times more likely, to uh, meet criteria for ADHD than children in the lowest tercile. Now, these are blood lead levels that are considerably lower than 10 microgram per deciliter, which is the World Health Organization definition of level of concern. So considerably lower than what's considered harmful at this point. When we looked at those children who were uh, prenatally exposed to tobacco and based on their tercile of exposure to lead, we found that these children who had both high exposure to lead and prenatal tobacco exposure, they were eight times more likely to experience, uh, to meet criteria for ADHD. Or another way to put that is, even though this group here represented only 7% of the children, they accounted for about one quarter of all cases of ADHD. Now, this could be simply spurious. It could be due to unmeasured confounders, and these are all important considerations. What we tried to do, and I'll try to give you some plausible mechanisms uh, that might help us to have more confidence that what we're seeing is real and not simply spurious or due to unmeasured confounders. In a, in a birth cohort of children who've been followed since the early 1980s, uh, particularly for lead exposure, we were able to measure about 157 of them for um, lead exposure and gray matter loss or total gray matter. And what we found here, as you can see with the highlighted areas in yellow and red, as the mean childhood blood lead levels increased, we saw deficits, especially in the prefrontal cortex area here. Overall, we saw about a 1.5% reduction in the total gray matter volume in the brain. We don't have specific measures for what percent loss in the, in the prefrontal cortex alone, but this is very consistent with some of the slides that, uh, uh, that Dr. Swanson showed you, that children with ADHD have smaller uh, brain volume in particular areas, and one of those areas was the prefrontal cortex. So this fits very uh, nicely and consistently with some of the other evidence. Now, if, if, it, if this were a mechanism for some children with ADHD, we might expect to see differences by sex of the subjects. ADHD predominantly impacts males, doesn't it? About two and a half fold in this particular analysis, the national survey I showed you a minute ago. So if this were a mechanism, we might expect to see differences that were focused in the male. And so of course what we found was exactly that. When we look at the, the gray matter loss, and again, particularly in the prefrontal cortex by uh, sex of the subjects, the, the greatest effects were seen in men. And these were 23-year-old men at the time of the, uh, the MRI studies. So again, very consistent with what, with what Jim showed you, is that children with ADHD have reduced uh, uh, prefrontal cortex and cingulate cortex, which is exactly the area we saw. Now we can also look at some of the animal studies to give us a little bit more confidence that maybe what we're seeing, again, is not simply an association. In this particular study, Jay Schneider exposed the um, dopaminergic cells from the forebrain of juvenile rats to various levels of lead, but exceedingly low concentrations, levels that are 100 times lower than you and I are, are exposed to today and our children are exposed to today, 100 times lower. Pico Miller levels different. And what, what Jay found is that even at levels 100 times lower than what we see today, already he saw evidence of stunting of the dendrites of these dopaminergic cells and from the prefrontal cortex of these rats. So again, very consistent uh, with, with the mechanism that we're proposing. Now another way to try to get at this, because even though we used a validated DSM-4 uh, survey, it does still rely on parent report. And so to the extent we can begin to look at and unpack at some of those types of functions that underlie ADHD, for example, some of the executive functions you've heard about, that we can measure more objectively, that we don't have to rely on maternal report, for example, that should give us more confidence that what we're seeing is real. And so we've done some studies, and in, in this particular case, it's called the uh, stockings of 
Cambridge, where you try to look to see whether children with the fewest number of move, moves can take different colored balls and mimic uh, a picture that they're given. And the fewer moves is a positive thing, is a good thing. What we found here is that as children's blood lead levels increased, it took them more moves to solve problems, to solve the stalking of Cambridge problems, but only amongst the boys. There is no significant difference for the girls. Again, very consistent not only with what we see epidemiologically, but um, what we saw with the brain imaging studies in the previous slides. I want to talk a little bit about the interactions of genes and environment, because I think this is quite important. From the standpoint of genes and environment, when we think of complex diseases, and ADHD is generally thought to be a complex disease, it's very possible that there are some cases of ADHD where the cause is predominantly genetic. It's not likely that there's some that are predominantly environmental unless perhaps you have extremely high exposures. We think most of ADHD is, as Max talked about, an interplay of genes and environment. That is, a child has to be both susceptible and exposed to some insult in order for ADHD to develop. You've also heard quite a bit about some of the different genes that might be at play. Uh, in particular, we were interested in uh, the dopamine-associated um, polymorphisms. And one of those, in particular, this is using tobacco as an example, gives, I think, a good idea of what, what we might expect to see with many of the um, types of environmental risk factors and genetic risk factors for ADHD. This is a study that looked at the interplay of both genes and environment, and in particular, they looked at children who had the DRD47 repeat gene, the high-risk gene here, and who were and were not exposed to tobacco prenatally. And what you'll see is for both children who had any ADHD and the combined type is that compared to the reference group in light blue, it was only those children who had both prenatal tobacco exposure or the environmental risk factor and the high risk genetic uh, polymorphism that were at increased risk. And I think this will turn out to be the dominant cause or interaction that leads to the development of ADHD. It's only when you look at both the genetic and the environmental risk factors that I think we're going to be able to um, tease apart uh, most of the conditions of ADHD. And this perhaps is an overstatement, but I think it's important to bring out because in some ways one might argue that it's going to be almost impossible to ever prove definitively that lead or any other environmental influence is the cause unless we dose kids with lead exposure. And we're not going to do that. So what can we do? What, when do we have sufficient evidence? And I would suggest that we actually do, in fact, have sufficient evidence now based upon both the, the animal data and the human studies. And if that's true, if we can agree that we have sufficient evidence, then one of the more important things we can take from this is that if we, if we agree, if we develop a consensus that lead, for example, is causally associated, is, a, is there sufficient evidence for causal association, we don't necessarily need to know the mechanism to prevent ADHD caused by lead. And in fact, we can go back and look at what happened with the first sanitarian movement. We saw dramatic reductions in infant death and childhood deaths from a whole host of infectious diseases, measles, polio, typhoid, cholera, before we developed antibiotics, before we developed vaccines, before we knew what the specific causes of many of those conditions were, simply by improving water treatment, for example. Or in this case, by reducing lead exposure, we can have dramatic impact. Now, I talked a little bit about what we saw in the, in the in Haines study, the United States National Study, because that's a national study and it's representative, we can estimate from that study what percent of children have ADHD as a result of either tobacco or lead exposure. And we estimate that if we eliminated tobacco exposure today and we eliminated lead exposure today, 
within a generation, there would be 30% fewer kids with ADHD, which is a phenomenal possibility. Now, is it definitive? No, it's not definitive, but it's pretty close. And I think one of the things we need to think about, on one hand, of course, we want to deal with children who are experiencing the difficulties of ADHD. On the other hand, we need to be able to look forward in the next generation and say, what can we do to protect kids from developing ADHD in the first place? Now, I use lead as an example, largely because we have more evidence, I think, than from other uh, types of environmental influences, but there are other environmental influences we shouldn't forget and we need to better understand. For example, prenatal alcohol exposure, certainly with high dose exposure, has been associated with executive dysfunctions that mimic or are compatible with ADHD. Mercury exposure, there's some evidence. Maternal depression, there's some evidence. Dietary additives, there's some concern, some evidence. But these aren't as fully developed as what we know about with lead or with tobacco. And clearly there will be others. Uh, one of the things that we're beginning to find with a whole host of other environmental toxicants, whether that's bisphenol A, the plastic chemical that many of us are exposed to, is that many of these environmental toxicants, for reasons that aren't entirely clear, act as dopaminergic toxicants, at least as one part of their toxic profile. And so it shouldn't surprise us, perhaps, that we're seeing quite a large prevalence of ADHD or executive function problems in, in our children. So in summary, there's increasing evidence that, that link uh, environmental toxicants with ADHD at children at levels previously thought to be safe. That the subtle effects that can sometimes be observed in children often progress to more serious disease or disabilities as they get older and they move into their adolescence. Now I should also say we've talked a little bit about some of the comorbidities of ADHD, at least in, among some children. We've talked about conduct disorder, learning problems often go hand in hand with uh, the uh, diagnosis of ADHD. For two of the things that I talked about today, lead and tobacco, they also act as risk factors for conduct disorder, criminal behavior, and learning problems. And so once again provides indirectly, I suppose, some support that these may underlie ADHD because they're systemic toxicants and have the same pattern of, of behavioral profiles that we see with, among some kids with ADHD. The childhood exposures to toxicants are associated with lifelong effects on brain function and behavior. We need to begin to think about how to protect the next generation as well as provide better care and management for children who already have ADHD. And finally, while this symposium is a lot about what you can do in the clinic setting and what families can do and what moms can do better to help kids, at some point there's an important role for society. There's a role that moms and dads can't contribute, that physicians can't take care of, and that is to make sure that the kinds of environmental toxicants that we're talking about today don't continue to occur. Now, we can all be grateful that the amount of lead and gasoline has come down dramatically. I don't know the exact year, but uh, leaded gasoline was banned in, in uh, Saudi Arabia and most countries by now in the past decade or before. That was probably the heaviest source of exposure we had, but there are still other sources and there's some, some great work that's, been gone on, that's gone on here to try to better understand the effects of lead uh, and the sources. And then finally, let me just end with this slide, which I think is particularly important, thinking about how many of the conditions that we see in children and the rest of us have an environmental component, and yet oftentimes we tend to blame the victim or we blame the family because they don't uh, provide enough structure for their children and that might serve as a, a risk factor for the development of ADHD or other problems. Few tragedies can be more extensive than the stunting of life, few injustices deeper than the de denial of an opportunity to strive or even to hope by a limit imposed from without, but falsely identified as lying within. There's, there's tremendous new evidence implicating at least a few of the environmental toxicants with ADHD and a whole host of other environmental induced conditions. And it's not, uh, not only is it not fair to blame the victims, the people who suffer from some of these conditions, but it's not very effective either. For a long time we've tried to suggest that people just not 
uh, do things that would expose them to lead. But families can't control the extent of exposure to lead or to plastics or many of the environmental chemicals. So one of the most important things we can do is find those areas where it's really up to society to reduce exposures and then where families need to be responsible they can. They can be. Thank you very much.